Hi, this is John Harcher, and welcome to the premiere of Left Turn at Albuquerque, a look at animation, its history, and availability on home video. And as luck would have it, we get to start off with a brand new release from Warner Archives, spotlighting a group of tunes never available in digital. Not at the top of the list tunes, many of those are already available, but a number of these are interesting in their own right. I knew I should have made a left turn at Albuquerque. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. I should have turned left at Albuquerque. So thanks for joining us in our premiere episode. I guess I'd consider myself an animation buff, though that could just be a euphemism for an adult who still watches cartoons. My niece has called me a big kid. Sometimes my wife calls me the same. But it's a legitimate art form deserving of study. You can look at the work of Frizz Freeling, Chuck Jones, Tex Avery, Bob Clampett, and do a study of them the same way you do someone like John Ford, Alfred Hitchcock, Martin Scorsese, those kind of filmmakers. Now there's already a lot out there on animation. First off, there's the godfather of modern animation studies, Jerry Beck. If you want the inside scoop on things, head over to Cartoon Brew. He's always got new things going over there, plus a lot of historical things as well. There's also a lot of good things on YouTube. Kaiser Bean's Merry History of Looney Tunes is a great overview of everything from beginning to end. If you want to look at the television part of Looney Tunes history, Pop Arena has a great hour on it in his look at the history of Nickelodeon. And if you want a real in-depth look at each tune individually, Anthony's Animation Talk is working on doing a video for every single one of them. So my approach is going to be informative and practical. What's out there, where you can get them, and should you spend your money on it. I'll start with the Looney Tunes Blu-rays and work out from there. We'll talk about the directors, the big names, and the lesser known ones, and see what unites their work together. Like for example, after a bunch of episodes, you'll see how the words Robert McKimson and conflict will immediately go together. We'll toss out some trivia, talk about the restoration work they've done on each, or lack thereof, and talk about how sometimes they can only do so much. Then we'll do a little TV history about where these shorts could have been seen over the years, whether it's on network and prime time on Saturday mornings, in syndication, and how that differed from market to market, and which ones finally showed up thanks to cable, be it on TBS, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, or Boomerang. I'd originally planned on starting off this show with a certain group of episodes, but I'm going to put those off until later on. The main reason for the change is, while I was in the planning stages for this, Warner Archives announced the release of the first Looney Tunes related collection in a number of years, so I figured, may as well start there, it's as good a place as any. On May 30th, Warner's, I'll just call them that, trying to figure out if it's Warner Brothers, Warner Discovery, Warner's whatever. You know, they released Looney Tunes Collector's Choice Volume 1. I'm going to guess if the line continues, the main focus will be on the shorts that have not yet appeared on home video, either on Blu-ray or even DVD. I'd say the vast majority of the really good ones are out already. We'll go over them as we get to the other releases. But there's still a few quality ones that needed to be collected. This release begins to winnow down what's left. So let's take a look at the 20 we get here. The disc leads off with Beanstalk Bunny from 1955, directed by Chuck Jones and written by Michael Maltese. Daffy Duck is Jack, and Bugs is along for the ride as they climb up the beanstalk to the clouds in Giant Elmer Fudd's castle. It's a bit of a stretch, but you can kind of think of this as the fourth chapter in the hunting saga, without any references to seasons, though there's a bit of back and forth over identities. He's Jack. This was a network short from the days of the primetime Bugs Bunny show back in the 60s. The closest thing to a digital release this tune had up until now is on the Japanese Laserdisc series, but it was on a VHS tape back in the day. There's great inventiveness here in Bugs' second take on the fairy tale. This should have been out in digital long time ago. The restoration on this is very clean. There's still enough grain in the picture to see the brush strokes in the background. Uh, this is one of Chuck Jones's more cinematic tunes. He utilizes the screen to the fullest, which is needed with the giant Elmer. Next is Catch as Cats Can from 1947, directed by Arthur Davis. He's one of those names you really don't know, but he was doing cartoons from the 30s all the way through to the 80s. 
Writers are Dave Monahan, who is a longtime Warner's writer, and Hubie Carp, a name I didn't know until this disc. A couple of birds modeled after Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra used Sylvester as a foil in their battle to win the hearts of the sock hop crowd. I think I remember this one from the early TBS days, but not much after that. This was very early in Sylvester's development, maybe his second or third short. Melbank was trying something different here with his voice as compared to his debut in Life with Feathers. He soon went back to that approach, which is the one we all know. The French Thuckatash. It's also interesting from the voice standpoint in that this is one of those shorts that gave us kids the wrong impression that Mel did everything in these shorts. Hit the road, stupid! He was a master, but he'd say he did voices, but not impressions. He actually did do a few, and we'll get to a couple on this disc. Frank Sinatra here was done by Dave Barry, and Bing Crosby was Dick Dickenbach. They still say ba boo Now this one has another very clean restoration, which can be difficult at times with these older shorts, as we'll see as we go along. Up next is the other Bugs Bunny short on the disc, The Unruly Hair, from 1945, directed by Frank Tashlin and written by Melvin Miller. He was an old friend of Frizz Freeling, but he actually also did a lot of work with Tashlin. Now, Elmer Fudd is a railway surveyor, and Bugs just keeps messing up with his work. There's also a lot of inventiveness here, not unexpected for a Frank Tashlin cartoon. This one wasn't on in New York all that much, if ever. I don't ever remember seeing it. But it was a staple on Channel 29 in Philadelphia. They even used segments of it for the bumpers of their Bugs Bunny show. It also looks like one that was on TBS sometime in the uh, early to mid-80s. Now, this short is one of two from 1945 included here. It was inexplicably left off both the Golden and Platinum collections. I mean, Tashlin only did two Bugs Bunnies. The other one is on an earlier set. So it's a very welcome inclusion here. This one is a little worse for wear during certain sequences. The cell when Bugs is using a fake head, that's pretty bad. But the overall restoration is good. Now, one interesting bit about the opening music, it later became the basis for the song What's Up Doc from the 1950 cartoon of the same name. That, in turn, became the theme song for a lot of the Bugs tunes in the 1950s. It's kind of like hearing the Meet the Flintstones theme music in a season one episode when it was still Rise and Shine's the main theme song. His Bitter Half with Daffy Duck is from 1950, directed by Frizz Freeling and written by Ted Pierce. Daffy sees that a rich widow duck wants to find a husband, so he offers himself as a prospect, only to find out she has an uncontrollable son, Wentworth. Now, oddly enough, Mrs. Daffy in the short is voiced by Martha Wentworth. Ah, shut up! Or I'll flap your mouth clean off in your face! Now, most of this short is actually on DVD through its appearance in the Daffy Duck's Thanks for Giving special from November 1980. I think that was on the uh, Essential Daffy Duck disc. This here is the entire short credits and all. It's the same basic plot as the later Yosemite Sam short, Honey's Money, from 1962, which actually made it out on Blu-ray before this. I honestly don't remember seeing this on TV at all other than in the Thanksgiving special. There's a few spotty cells here and there, but once again, the restoration is pretty crisp. Another Daffy Duck one is next, this one with Porky Pig as well, Daffy Doodles from 1946, directed by Robert McKimson and written by Warren Foster. Michael Maltese, Ted Pierce, and Warren Foster were the three main writers of Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies in the classic era from 1940 through 1958 or so. In this tune, Daffy is the mustache fiend and Porky is the cop set out to arrest him. Now, along with Mel Blanc on Voices, we get the great narrator of the Looney Tunes era, Robert C. Bruce, at the beginning of the short. And draws mustaches on all the ads. This was the first tune for McKimson as a director. He may have taken over production of this from Frank Tashlin. It does have some of Tash's touches in it. McKimson's template of what I call two characters in conflict is set up here right off the bat. Now, this is actually available on DVD as an extra to the Barbara Stanwyck film, My Reputation. Insert your Big Valley joke here. Uh, but this is a Blu-ray debut. I don't remember seeing this on Channel 5. It might have been there. I think it was uh, on Channel 29 more. 
Uh, it was definitely on TBS and on Cartoon Network later on. This is the first tune on the disc to have a Blue Ribbon title card. When the company reissued the tunes in the mid-50s, they got rid of the original titles on a number of them. For some of them, those original title cards have been completely lost. For others, like A Wild Hair, it took a long time to find them. The restoration here is crystal clear, like they used practically brand new cells, except for the judge's bench at the end. There's a little couple of spots there. We get some more Daffy and Porky with Cracked Quack from 1952, directed by Freeling and also written by Foster. Daffy gets tired of flying south for the winter, so he stops off at Porky's place and substitutes himself for a stuffed duck that looks just like him. Porky's busy doing his taxes, but his dog Rover is suspicious. I think I remember this one as far back as Channel 5 in syndication. I know I definitely saw it on TBS. And I think it's on Boomerang right now in their rotation. Hard to believe for a tune that was on TV all the time that it was never on home video, but apparently so. Restoration here is as clean as a whistle. Next, we get Little Orphan Airedale from 1947 and the debut of Charlie Dog, directed by Chuck Jones and written by Maltese and Pierce. Charlie has his origins back in an old black and white cartoon by Bob Clampett called Porky's Pooch. This one was one of three with the Charlie and Porky duo done in the space of a year and has basically the same plot as the other ones. Charlie wants a master and latches onto Porky who really doesn't want a dog at all. Now I don't remember seeing this much of syndication. I probably didn't see it until TBS. And Mel Blanc actually kind of makes an appearance on screen. He's the prospective owner with a mustache. It's sort of patterned after him. This one also has a Blue Ribbon title card. Now as for the restoration, oh my god, what happened to that opening cell? Ugh, all those white splotches? Eesh. The backgrounds are pretty messy, but there's not really much they can do about it. Yeah. The main character animation does look great. The first of two Roadrunner Coyote cartoons on the disc is up next, Hip Hip Hurry from 1958. Chuck Jones directed all the duo shorts from 1949 through 1960, then had co-directors until he left the studio in the mid-60s for MGM. These were all written by Michael Maltese as well through 1959 until he left the studio for Hanna-Barbera. Now let's get this established now. Background animator Paul Julian is the voice of the Roadrunner. He'd usually run through the halls of Termite Terrace doing that meep beep to get people out of the way. Craig Brown recorded it and then sped it up for the tune. You still hear it to this day. Beep, beep. What I usually do with the Roadrunner shorts is give a rundown of all the crazy plans Wiley Coyote does to catch the bird. So when you hear it, maybe like, you know, something will go off in your mind like, oh yeah, I remember that one. So let me just list them out. The Roadrunner hits a fork in the road and heads in all three directions and comes up behind the coyote to scare him twice. And then he falls off a burn through bridge as he's trying to catch up. The coyote drops a grenade on the Roadrunner, but it hits the electrical wires and springs back up. He drops the pin, and another grenade comes back up and explodes. Coyote uses a trapeze to catch the Roadrunner, but falls off and gets hit by a truck. He tries using a slingshot with a stick of dynamite, but it explodes. He then tries using a stick of dynamite in a road with a long fuse, but then he chases the Roadrunner until he's right in front of it when it blows up. He tries using a big boulder off of a cliff, but the cliff breaks and the coyote ends up under the boulder. He uses a speedboat to catch the roadrunner. He almost ends up going off one waterfall only to go off another waterfall in the other direction. He finally uses high speed vitamin tonic to run really fast. He tries it out on a mouse first. He drinks too much of it. The roadrunner trips him and he rolls into a hut with dynamite which explodes and launches him up into the sky. This tune is one of the John Seeley Six. Due to a musician strike in 1958, these cartoons had the music supplied by the Columbia House Library. <laughs> Restoration here is crisp. You can still see the pencil lines in the background. Another Chuck Jones, Michael Maltese classic about the duo follows Hot Rod and Reel from 1959. Roadrunner crosses a cliff, Coyote steps on it, and the other cliff breaks. It gets stuck on a branch, then when he steps off, the other cliff falls. The coyote tries using roller skates. Roadrunner tries to trip him again, but he jumps over it and goes sailing off a cliff. 
Coyote tries using a camera with a gun inside, but he forgets to take the cap off. Coyote tries using a trampoline that folds up when he hits it. He tries using a crossbow with dynamite, only the crossbow shoots out, leaving the dynamite. He tries using a jet-powered pogo stick that goes off a cliff. He tries using fake railroad tracks and a record, only to get by a real train. He comes up with a giant funnel for bombs, but they won't leave the box. And it ends with the rocket-powered unicycle. I think this was a syndicated one. IMDB doesn't have it listed as part of the Roadrunner show, uh, but it may have popped up later on ABC. Restoration on this looks really good. I mean, it's like almost 3D at times. Next up is Greedy for Tweety from 1957. For his feeling directed, Warren Foster did the story. Sylvester is on this disc quite a bit, but this is the only one with his frequent co-star. Tweety, Sylvester, and Hector the dog all end up in the hospital still want to pester one another. Granny, whose voice at this point was done by June Ferre, is the nurse uh, taking care of them all. This was sort of remade as an Ant and Aardvark cartoon in the early 70s, a series that was produced by Frizz Freely. Now this is definitely a network tune. The restoration on this is spotless. Speaking of Sylvester, he's back in Stooge from Mouse from 1950. Frizz directed, but there's no story credit. IMDB has been Hardaway listed, but obviously in the short, he's uncredited. He was actually over at Universal around this time, though a couple of his scripts did get made at Warner's in the early 50s. They may have been laying around from the old days. We will talk about Ben and his very well-known nickname in a later episode. So in this one, Sylvester and his bulldog friend, not Hector, I think it was Spike, but they changed it eventually because of the confusion with the Tom and Jerry Spike, uh, they're both living in a house very nicely together until a mouse comes in and wants some cheese, so he's able to turn the two against one another. Frizz redid this one as well as Bugsy and Bugsy from 1957. It's basically the same plot. Now, as for this cartoon, I don't remember seeing this at all until it appeared in the current 132 boomerang rotation. The restoration is okay, but there's some pretty bad cells in here. But again... You can't do too much about that with it you know, completely destroying the integrity of the artwork. And hey, guess what? We have even more from our favorite speech impedimented cat, a mouse divided from 1953 by the Freeling and Foster combo. Mr. and Mrs. Sylvester get an unexpected delivery from the drunken stork, a baby mouse. Needless to say, the cat neighbors would like to eat meet the new baby, this may have been on the network since way back. It was part of the original run of the Bugs Bunny show on ABC back in primetime, and they recycled a lot of those into the Saturday morning shows, both on CBS and ABC. Restoration here, very nice, very few spots. Next up is a couple of tunes from our favorite, I say our favorite, Rooster Foghorn Leghorn. A Fractured Leghorn is from 1950, directed, as I believe all the classic era Foghorns were, by Robert McKimson. This one was written again by Warren Foster. Foghorn and a cat go into a fishing battle over one little worm. This one has been on TV a lot, at least since the TBS days. Uh, it's a long time waiting for this one to be on home video. There was this Looney Tunes Superstars video DVD for Foghorn way back when, when for some reason they repeated one tune from the Golden Collections. There was a whole bunch still unreleased. They should have used this one instead. Restoration on this one is as good as a Stooge for a Mouse from the same year. You know, there's a couple of spotty things here and there. Foghorn is back in Plop Goes the Weasel from 1953, also by McKimson, but this time written by Ted Pierce. A weasel is looking for something to eat. Barnyard Dog is there to protect the chicks, but Foghorn keeps getting in his way. Wait, does he want the little chicks to be eaten? Uh, I don't know, it's kind of, kind of weird there. Uh, I think I remember this one from syndication, but it didn't get heavy rotation until, I'd say, the Cartoon Network days in the late 90s. It's interesting to compare a 1950 restoration to a 1953 one like we did with Stewed for a Mouse and a Mouse Divided. It's the same thing with these two Foghorn Leghorn shorts. The 1950 one is okay. The 1953 one is stellar looking. There's one or two cells not perfect, but it's excellent looking in general. 
Next is The Tale of Two Mice from 1945, one of the two oldest shorts on the disc, and both of those are by Frank Tashlin. This one has the blue ribbon title card, so we don't see the credits, but it's written by, guess who, Warren Foster. This is the follow-up to A Tale of Two Kitties, featuring Babbitt and Cat Stello, and the debut of a little bird we'd later know as Tweety. Now this time, they're back, and as the title suggests, they're mice, and they want to get cheese from a cat. Ted Pierce does the voice of Babbitt, and Mel does Cat Stello, and a very good Lou Costello impersonation. See, Mel, you could do it. You're scared of the cat. Scared of the cat. <laughs> scared of the cat. Scared. <laughs> so I'm scared of the cat. This one is on DVD as an extra to the Errol Flynn Western San Antonio. I think I remember it from Channel 5 syndication, but it was definitely on TBS. The main character restoration is good, but the background cells can be messy at times. Oh, I'm a bad boy. Now, even though this has a blue ribbon title card, YouTuber Thad K found the original titles out there somewhere, so he's posted them well, with a recreation on his version. If you look on YouTube, you'll find it there. Interestingly, take a notice at one of the names under the animators. It's Richard Beckenbach, a.k.a. Dick Beckenbach. You see, Termite Terrace just always used anybody they could to help out with their talent. So this was a case because Dick could apparently do a good Bing Crosby, so they pressed him into action. The Foxy Duckling from 1947 is next. It's another Blue Ribbon title card, so you can go over to IMDb to figure out the credits. This is a one-shot directed by Art Davis and written by George Hill, not to be confused with George Roy Hill. An insomniac fox who needs some nice down for his pillows chases after a duck with the usual ensuing hijinks. There's not much dialogue. This one owes more to the Columbia-type tunes that Davis used to work with before he joined uh, Warner Brothers. This is another home video debut, and in fact, I don't remember this one on TV at all. That's usually what happened with a lot of these one-shots. Uh, the backgrounds are a little rough, and there's a bad cell here and there, but overall pretty good restoration for a 1947 short. Two Gophers from Texas from 1948 follows. Uh, it's another blue ribbon title card, so check IMDb, Art Davis directing. And, oh, the writers on this one are pretty interesting. Lloyd Turner became a sitcom writer in the 60s and 70s. The other writer became quite famous in his own right in a different cartoon series. Bill Scott later wrote and was the voice for everyone's favorite moose, Bullwinkle. Speaking of voices, Mel Blanc did the voice of one of the gophers and Stan Freeberg did the other. They didn't get the names Mac and Tosh until the Bugs Bunny show in the 60s. After you. No, please, after you. In this tune, a dog hunts down said goofy gophers, but has the tables turned on him more than once. Now, the dogs in these early gopher shorts are all very theatrical in their performances, Now, especially the next one uh, in the series, Ham and a Roll. I have to say, this cartoon just flat out looks odd. It's just the way the figures are drawn, and just the way that they're, they're, they sit into the background, it just looks strange. Uh, I honestly don't remember this one until the Cartoon Network Boomerang era. The restoration is excellent top to bottom, though the piano at the end is a little rough. Now, for a guy who's not that well-known, Art Davis gets his third on a row on the disc, Doggone Cats from 1947. So why wasn't this one right after the other one from 1947, especially since it was also done by Turner and Scott? You could have had them flip-flop, but whatever. Wellington the dog has to deliver a package to Uncle Louie, but Sylvester, who doesn't speak, and his friend make his trip a hassle. Wellington would turn up the next year in Art Davis's Odor of the Day, which may or may not also have Pepe Le Pew. Mel Blanc also does some very proto-Dino noises in this one. You're sitting there listening and you hear a dog bark. It's like, wait a minute, that, that's not a dog, that's Dino, you know? <laughs> This is a home video debut of this tune. I don't remember seeing it much, probably on Cartoon Network. There's a Chinese stereotype in here that may have caused it to stay out of sight, but it could have been edited out. There are some rough backgrounds, but again, decent enough for 1947. You know, the ones from this year all kind of look the same. 
The final two tunes are starring the Three Bears. They'd made their debut in a Bugs Bunny short in 1944 by Chuck Jones. A few years later, Jones resurrected them for a short series of cartoons. The first of them is What's Bruin Bruin from 1948. This is a blue ribbon title card, so I take a look at IMDb to show Michael Maltese and Ted Pierce did the script. The three bears get ready to hibernate for the winter, but they just can't quite get to sleep. Some of the jokes here are the same types that were in the Porky cartoons, Porky's Bedtime Story and Tick Tock Tuckered. I don't remember this one from syndication. Maybe it was on TBS, but I definitely remember it by the time Cartoon Network got it. Uh, cells are really splotchy on this with lots of debris throughout it, but again, kind of nothing they could do. They were just stuff on the cells. You can only clean up so much. Now, in the original short, Mel Blanc did Papa Bear, B. Benadera did Mama Bear, and Kent Rogers did Junior. In this short, Mel does Mama for her two lines. Jim, amen. As well as other various noises. The other two were done by a couple of the many talents, we didn't really find out about due to Mel's exclusivity contract. Papa Bear was done by Billy Bletcher and Junior is done by Stan Freeberg. This is something I'll be pointing out along the way to help shine a light on people who did great work that we just didn't know about. It's not Mel's fault. You know, Warners gave him the exclusivity deal. Quiet! Uh, there is a funny story from Freeberg that we'll get to eventually about how the deal kind of ended. A year later, the Bears returned in the bedeviled Bruin with Jones directing and just Maltese on writing duties. This time they're out for hunting, the usual hijinks occur, getting stung by bees, all that fun stuff. This has the voice cast in place for the rest of the shorts of Billy Bletcher as Papa. I'm gonna get me some more honey! Be better there as Mama. But Henry, I... By the way, she was also Mrs. Sylvester in A Mouse Divided. Lazy, good for nothing. And Stan Freework as Junior. I am not yet high enough. Oh. Now, it doesn't look like this has ever been on home video of any kind, and I know I remember seeing it on TV. The restoration is way better in this tune. I found, like, just one bad cell. It's, again, like anything that was 1947 or very close just looks substandard. You know, just, I don't know what they were doing with the cartoons that year. Now, Billy Bletcher is most famously the voice of another fairy tale character, the Big Bad Wolf, first in Disney's Three Little Pigs and its numerous sequels, then at other companies, including Warner's for Little Red Riding Rabbit. He's got this big, booming voice, which is ironic because he wasn't that big of a guy. I remember watching this one episode of The Lone Ranger from the first season, so it's like 1949, 1950. One of the guest stars in that episode was Dr. McCoy himself, DeForest Kelly. It was his second time on the show. So his partner is this little guy talking like this. But, you know, he's talking, and all of a sudden I'm like looking, and I'm like, wait a minute, that's Billy Bletcher? <laughs> just one of those things with the sound and the visuals just don't quite match up. So here's the recap. Out of the 20 tunes, we get two Bugs Bunnies, and two Elmers for that matter, two Daffy and Porky team-ups, and one of them each solo, plus Daffy's co-star and one of Bugs Bunnies. Four Sylvesters, plus one Tweety and Sylvester. Two Roadrunner Coyotes, two Foghorn Leghorns, two Three Little Bears, a Batman and Costello, a Goofy Gopher, and a One-Shot. Director Rise, we get six by Fritz Freeling, five by Chuck Jones, four by Art Davis, three by Robert McKimson, and two by Frank Tashlin. Now, my main criticisms about the disc are basically cosmetic. Uh, you know, packaging is a little, uh, a little sparse here. You know, kind of like the kind you'd get at the Walmart, you know, in a five-dollar bin. You know, could have used a could have used a booklet here, you know, just for credits and stuff like that. Um, yeah, nothing fancy, just a two-pager. For the more intensive viewers, uh, they don't have any commentary tracks on the tunes by you know the usual suspects: Jerry Beck, Michael Barrier, Greg Ford, Eric Goldberg, Mark Kausler, John Kay, Eddie Fitzgerald. And all those guys. Also, I'm not really sure why they picked this particular order for the tunes. You know, chronologically, you would have gotten all those 1947 tunes all in a row, so good call there to mix them up a bit. When the set was announced, they listed all the tunes alphabetically. That's actually not too bad of a flow. You still start out with Beanstalk Bunny, and you would have ended with What's Bruin Bruin, which is next to last on this disc. The Devil Bruin is 
to be honest, not that really that strong of a closer. But for the purposes of getting these cartoons restored in high quality and getting them available to the public in a reasonably priced form, this release does that perfectly. As with all things at Warner Archives, thanks to George Feltenstein for his continued effort in getting these cleaned up and back out for sale. Boy, did we dodge a bullet a few years back when they let him go and then quickly brought him back. Now, he's been focusing on just a few things at a time. Uh, we had a stretch when he did all the Popeye tunes from the 40s, the color ones. He did two or three of those. Then he did the Tex Avery collections. A few years back, he did the Bugs Bunny box, so now he came out with this. So, if this does well, they'll keep putting them out. So, qualified thumbs up. Just be aware these aren't the top of the list tunes, but like I said, they're all interesting in their own ways. I'd have to think they at least have a volume two in mind. I wouldn't mind a different kind of presentation. In the future, we'll go over the uh, previous Blu-ray collections first and see what worked and what didn't. Then we'll look at what's not yet out and how best to get it to the public. Uh, quick note before we go, I added links to the site we mentioned before in the area below. Uh, thanks to Jaw Print for doing the Left Turn compilation on YouTube and to Thad K for the Tales of Two Mice original credits. So next time we'll go back to the first Blu-ray set, Platinum Collection Volume 1. We'll see what they did there and if it's still worth seeking out. I'm John Hartra. Thanks for watching and listening.